Hi, I came all the way from Africa to be here. Um, <laughs> Don't, don't applaud. They literally pay me to do that, so it's, it's okay. Um, no, I even got, even got in a few hours with my wife at home in the States. Um, so, uh, right, so it's 2017, uh, just in case you hadn't gotten the memo yet. Um, and uh, we're coming off of um, our big conference that we have every year, uh, so that's one of the really we announced a lot of things, and it's, some of the stuff was even a surprise to me, so I figured, come out and talk about it. Um, so my name is Ben Marks. I'm, I serve as Magento's evangelist. I've had this role officially for three years and unofficially probably for like eight um, altogether. I work on our uh, strategy and growth team. Um, actually, a few of my colleagues are here um, in town for Seamless. Uh, e-commerce conference, which I'm pretty, we're, we're pretty excited about. I, I like that we're getting, doing a little bit more in Asia these days. Um, this is my contact information, Twitter, and uh, my email. Um, if uh, just a little bit of my credentials, I've um, been developing with Magento since 2008. Um, joined uh, Magento U as an instructor, 2011. Uh, been with Magento since 2014, so uh, just um, actually coming up on my third anniversary in uh, in a few days. Um, and I I fly a lot um, just because our and and so I just crossed a million miles with uh, Delta, um, and it's not really me bragging because uh, I would never recommend this for anyone. It's that you should always pity people who have to fly that much, um, but it's just a demonstration of how absolutely big our community is. So I can go pretty much anywhere in the world and uh, say, hey, I'm here, and someone will come and they'll talk Magento with me, which is uh, really cool. And I, I do fly enough now that they started let, letting me serve snacks uh, on the plane. That's me there. Um, so the, the, the thing for me, um, you know, Magento, Magento's been around. Magento has helped, um, has helped shape uh, the commerce landscape for sure. Uh, came out in 2000 and uh, beta dropped in 2007. Um, we have uh, we have been responsible for I, I don't know shift I think not just in, in um, empowering empowering merchants and the developers that work for them and kind of adapt our software to their needs, uh, but we've 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 helped you know through through all of this we've helped shape markets uh, around the world. Um, so the markets that we're talking about now, like just in the U.S., um, a, a pretty astounding figure jumped out uh, for March. Um, sales growth outside of traditional retail is three times what it was for retail. Um, so what we're seeing is basically just things shifting, uh, shifting from, you know, being present in the store to all of the different channels uh, where people are buying things. Uh, and that, it makes it really challenging if you're trying to manage this in one place. Um, so our piece of this worldwide, uh, last year, um, uh, for the sort of the commercial volume, basically the uh, sales that we enabled uh, that went through Magento Code, 101 billion US dollars. Uh, that's not our figure, that's someone else's figure. We wish we had insight, but that's, that's what stinks about open source. People use our stuff and we have no idea who they are or, um, you know, or, or, or you know, how well or not they're doing. Um, another stat for me that, that jumps out is our revenue. And this doesn't include like developer salaries, but just the revenue for people involved somehow engaged in the business of Magento, 4.2 billion. Um, it's a lot, right? And and for me, it's not. Again, this isn't this isn't like a this is not a bragging statistic. It actually is a pretty humbling statistic for us because we have to do uh, basically. If we screw up, we're screwing up for a lot of people. We're messing with people's ability to you know save for their kids' college, to um, go and take vacations, to have a good life. Um, I've watched several of my uh, several of my friends who I met on IRC, you know, in the in the Magento chat room in 2007. These people now have you know companies of their own, you know, with millions in turnover. 
And that's just really, that, that to me is, it's always what keeps me going. Um, our ecosystem, and I would say if you're here, you're part of that ecosystem. Um, we've got a lot of our official solution partners, a lot more uh, unofficial partners, people, small agencies, independent developers doing this work. Um, a lot of uh, certified developers, uh, that's for Magento 1 right now. We're just getting ready to uh, start up with Magento 2 certification. A lot of engagement around the world, and as I said, 4.2 billion in ecosystem revenue. Um, so imagine, anyway, that's a background for those of you who aren't familiar with sort of like the size and scope, uh, and that's about as sales pitchy as I get about us. Um, we just had our big conference. We, uh, we have it in Vegas every year, except for the very first year. Um, and it's grown every year. Uh, this year it was 3,000 people from 50 countries. Uh, there would have been more, but um, people are less inclined to travel to the United States these days. <laughs> and I'll leave it there. Um, so imagine, of course, it's our, big, it's our big show. It's at the Wynn, which is one of the top um, and perhaps the top uh, casino uh, venue in Vegas. Mr. Wynn actually, when we, came, when we finally got to the Wynn a couple years ago, Mr. Wynn actually gave our keynote, uh, gave the keynote at, at the conference, and you know, we found out like he built all of modern Las Vegas. Like That was literally all of him. So. It's a really cool place to be. It's a great place. It's a great backdrop for announcements. Um, so we have, um, as part of our announcements, um, we've been talking about B2B um, for a little while now. And, and one of the interesting things as a developer, um, so if you're working in the commerce space, right, the, the thing is commerce is always, always custom. Like, you can, you can use a SaaS solution for your, for your, for your commerce needs, and, and if, it's, if it's flexible enough and it matches what you need. But at some point, usually you're, you're getting up against a wall with what that vendor, whoever makes that software, how they think commerce works. Uh, and, and, and there's nothing wrong with, with vendors doing that because at some point you have to make a decision and say, okay, I think this is how taxation works. This is how uh, promotions should work. The, the difference between a SaaS solution and, uh, and like an on-premise solution um, is that with an on-premise solution, you can take, you can get around our idea. You can do all sorts of good things and even some bad things if you want. Um, so that for me is a backdrop uh, to talk about B2B, which is, uh, which is growing uh, I think more rapidly than B2C. And B2B is an interesting challenge because we, so, so one of the things that, that came out recently was we found out that we're the number one um, provider for, or peop, we're the number one uh, software in the B2B space and we don't make a B2B version. Like it's, it's literally, it's B2C. Um, so we're, we're, we're designed for business to consumer yet people are taking our platform and adapting it. Um, as a developer, super challenging because um, there are, there's a lot of logic that goes into things like price calculation, especially because we have multiple scopes. Like, so you can take one Magento instance and host for 20 different regions with different currencies and different languages. And if you start to think about that, if your developer mind starts crunching that, okay, like I've got 100,000 SKUs and they all have prices. Now I need to convert these for currencies and maybe I have different prices and different currencies. And you can start to imagine the indexation uh, challenge that's involved. Like this is one of the sticking points for Magento and adapting to B2B because uh, what, there, there are lots of common requirements across B2B projects, but one of them is, um, one of them is actually um, individual price lists. So take that 100,000 SKUs, now multiply it by however many customers, and you really start to see the, the challenge. So that is just one example of things that we have to solve. Um, also, for B2C, um, for B2C, you just have like, hey, I'm the merchant, you're the customer. That's it. There's no hierarchy there besides that relationship. Um, so for us, we model, uh, we model um, 
that well in our core product, but businesses usually have some kind of hierarchy, like this person belongs to an organization, and these people are approvers for these people. So people have been building this stuff in the Magento for a really long time. So um, one of the things that we've managed to do in the last year is actually roll out an, an alpha um, bolt-on B2B product. Um, that will come out later this year, like in, in general release. Um, so that's, that's sort of that top line. Um, we are, as a business, looking heavily at uh, Asia-Pacific region, um, especially in Southeast Asia. Um, we did a little tour last year, and we found out um, we found out the extent to which Magento has to be adapted to work for uh, customers in uh, consumers in various countries uh, throughout throughout Asia. Um, so that became part of our uh, part of our focus and part of our strategy. And then we ended up um, once we were spun out of eBay, we were bought by a company named Premira, private equity company. And now um, we have had an additional investment from Hill House Capital, and they're, they're uh, based, I believe, in Hong Kong. Um, so they're actually going to help us uh, really expand into Asia Pacific. And basically, it just means that, that we have, you know, we'll have some more connections. Uh, we'll, be able to, um, we'll be able to move a little bit more strategically. We actually just opened up an office in Singapore. Uh, so we, we actually do have presence in the region now. Nor, like before, back in the day, every, like Asia Pacific was handled by the closest person possible, and that closest person was in California. You know, it's just, just, just right across the ocean. Um, um, we, have, uh, we released in the last year a, a platform, uh, PAAS, PAAS, Platform as a Service. Um, so this is different from a SaaS because you still have full control of your source code, but we have guide rails. Basically, we have containers built in, and we're using a, really, a, a pretty strong partner, Platform.sh, uh, so that helps with deployment. It's, it's, it's really neat. I don't, I don't have a demo here, um, but if you're interested, I can get you a demo. It's just uh, it's a quick, uh, if, you need a new, if you need a new instance to uh, play around with or blow up, just create, just, just take a, make a branch and deploy it, and it's, and it's live. And it's got built-in CDN, and um, built-in yeah, built CDN, built-in New Relic, built-in Blackfire, um, and, uh, and a couple other things. We have a marketplace, which is good for us because it's, uh, it's a uh, developer, um, it's basically a way to leverage other developers' work, right? So you've got, uh, you've got extensions that Ex the, the provide additional functionality. You don't have to build this stuff yourself. Uh, we finally, we released a new marketplace for Magento 2 for those extensions, and we just broke a thousand of those. Um, and then we, we acquired a whole bunch of stuff. Um, I forgot we didn't check the audio. We'll see if the audio works. Does the, should the audio work, do you think? Okay. It's, a, it's okay. No, they're just, it's just product demos. Anyone interested in product demos, come find me after, and I'll, um, I'll be able to show them to you. So uh, we're on an R&D tear. Um, so we have an analytics platform that we just bought, because that just made a lot of sense, rather than build it ourselves. And we brought the whole company in-house. Um, that's that used to be called RJ Metrics. Now it's business intelligence. Um, Right, it actually helps build out a lot of our reporting functionality. It also is going to give us a lot of insight across um, all the merchants that are using it. We have an order management project, which we absolutely, uh, which we've been building out with a team in Barcelona for a while. So this is this is if you you know if you're thinking omnichannel, that's the solution. Um, I mentioned our B two B. Those of you who have used Magento probably are aware that CMS is a bit anemic in the core product. Uh, so we, we found a really, we found a couple of products to put together, uh, a page building product uh, with drag and drop functionality and uh, the ability to create um, new content types. Uh, that video, actually, if you're interested, that demo is, is it's pretty cool to look at. Um, we also announced Magento Social. So just a connector that allows you to just, with the push of a button, for a very, for like very low monthly rate, um, get uh, take your products and 
slurp them right into a Facebook store and build campaigns uh, pretty easily off of that. And then we also, we partnered with Tomando uh, for Magento shipping. Okay, I'm going to skip product videos. That's what happens when your cab is late. All right, um, so down to, the, down to the developer stuff. Um, Magento 1, end of life. We no longer support it after uh, November of next year. Um, I stress that because people keep asking me. But uh, it, it is the fact that we're, we're, we're doing an end of life there. There's a lot of reasons to end it um, at that time. It's, it, it will be three years to the date uh, from when we released Magento 2. When, and we said we would end support three years later. It is also our, um, it's also the case that um, PHP 5 is dead January 1st of 2019. So we don't want to have to, it's actually not that difficult. It, I think it's about four actual, four line, four, four changes to make Magento 1 work on uh, PHP 7. But as far as us officially supporting it, we just don't, we, we're not going to continue to make the investment there. Um, Magento 2 is getting the traction uh, that we've been looking for now. We're, we're, we're close to 10,000 live stores. Um, we just had our 2.1.6 release. 2.2 um, release candidate will be coming up here in the next couple of months. Um, one of the things that we're working on, so one of, the one, of, one, of the, one of the challenges that we had to face going from Magento 1 to Magento 2 was building test coverage. So Magento 1 was a, is this, you know, this monolith, doesn't use Composer, uh, uses, uh, uses God object, um, does a lot of things that make it tough to test. And the reason for that was because it came out in 2007 and not a lot of people were testing their PHP apps in 2007. So, um, one of, our, one of our real challenges was to build this thing, build Magento 2 with testing in mind and with, with test coverage in the core. Um, we are actually retooling that further because what we want to do is we want to hit this right here. And that is have more frequent but smaller releases. Right now we have these, these kind of monolithic releases where we try and pack in a whole bunch of change set. Uh, and that, the reason for that is because it's actually really, it's a lot of effort for us to pack up a release. There's a lot of manual QA, a lot of manual regression testing and so forth. Um, so we're making a whole bunch of investment in that testing framework. Uh, and that sets up a lot of the other things that we're going to be doing. Um, so on the one hand, yes, more frequent releases, but the idea is that it'll be much easier, much more smooth to upgrade from one release to the next because you'll know the delta there. Our, um, and, and by the way, actually, if you don't know, Magento, um, when we start talking about numbers, release uh, versions, we have this thing called a marketing version. That's the, that's the two dot whatever. That's where we talk about specific features or you know, maybe specific fixes going in. But then underneath, we have a platform. So if you aren't familiar, actually, I'm going to go off script here. I'm just kidding. There's no script. Um, uh, if you're not familiar with it, um, we have, well, hopefully you're familiar with PHP Storm. It's literally, if you're, if, you're doing, um, if, you're, if you're doing Magento development, it's highly recommended to, to, to use this. Um, Right, so these are, these are some new features that you'll see. Well, I say new. These are new, new to Magento. Um, this whole um, Composer thing, right? Everyone here using Composer, I assume? If, if not, it's okay. Um, but if you're not, it really, it's, it's, it's the package manager that we should have always had. Um, yep. There we go. Um, Right, so we uh, we use a lot of uh, we use a lot of other people's work, and that's part of the whole benefit of using Composer. Is like if we need if we need to build OAuth into Magenta two, just use someone else's OAuth package. That stuff is voodoo anyway. We don't want to have to get in there and figure it out, and we don't want to have to maintain it if someone else is doing it. Now that is 
possible only because we made the decision for Magenta 2 uh, to uh, implement PSRs, right? So we've implemented uh, PSRs, well, technically <coughs> zero through four. Um, but then we also joined uh, the PHP FIG, which is the, the group that actually makes those standard recommendations. Uh, and so I'm, I'm our representative on the FIG. But this has been, uh, this has been, this has actually made more inroads, I think, for us connecting with PHP developers in general, um, because the problem that we have, sorry, I was trying to stay still. Um, the, one, of the, one of the challenges that people had as they start, as Magento gained popularity, was modern PHP developers were coming over, uh, they, you know, they were, they were like, okay, so someone tells me I have to work on this Magento project, and they look at it, and it doesn't look anything like, like the, the, the kind of PHP, modern PHP development that they're doing. So for us, it was important for us to be able to use other people's work. It was also important to, um, to have a project structure that makes sense to modern professional PHP developers. Um, let's see. What else did we talk about? Um, we, have a, uh, we have a pretty neat system for, um, for customization, right? So, if you're not, is anyone actually working with Magento 2 already? Or is it pretty much just Magento 1 developers? A, a little bit. Okay, cool. So, it, it's, it's actually, you know, so, you know, an extension. Like, if you need to change, if you need to change core code, if you need to um, add to it, if you need to modify behavior, whatever it is, you're making an extension in Magento. And the reason you make that an extension is just like plugins in other systems, you want to build your change in a way that's upgrade safe, right? You don't want to actually go in and change the core code. Um, so we give you a few ways to customize, uh, and that's true for Magento 1 and 2. In Magento 2, we went, we went really deep. Um, so we still have our event observer. Um, so I can, uh, in, in, my, in my module, and, and creating a module in Magento 2 is super easy, right? Because it's just, it's a registration file. And this actually ends up hooking up with um, the uh, PSR for autoloader. Um, and then, uh, let's see, there is a module configuration where you just tell the system, like, hey, here's my, here's my namespace and module name, and here's the, the version number so you can check for migration, right? Basically see if we need to update data or schema. And then... And that actually, those, those two files are, that's it. Like, that, that actually creates an extension. Um, then you have to use a console command. Um, and I wonder if I actually have... Okay. Yeah, Docker's down. Um, basically, we have a command line tool that helps, helps do a lot of developer stuff. And it's extensible. It uses Symfony components. Um, we actually use Zen Framework 1, Zen Framework 2, and Symfony 2. Uh, <laughs> um, just, you know, just pieces of, uh, just pieces of each. Um, but for customization, we actually have dependency injection. This was probably the biggest architectural shift that we made uh, for, uh, for M2. And what this does is this actually allows us, as long as you're using, well, preferably using interfaces for everything, uh, like we do in most places in the core code, you can swap out implementations if you need to. And for those of you who know Magento 1, that's, that's basically the same thing as a rewrite, class rewrite. It's not actually the way that we want you to customize things. What we want you to do is we want you to um, target specific classes and change only the, the public methods uh, that you need to. So what we did with M2, with our dependency injection system, was we actually made, in addition, sorry, in addition to our event observers, so if you're familiar with events in whatever framework or environment you're, you're used to dealing, um, we have, um, so we have just a very simple event dispatching mechanism. It is just, it is literally a, a string uh, that is broadcast basically to the top of the stack, and then relevant items are passed in. So, for example, um, when you add a product to the cart, 
a lot of times you need to hook in custom functionality there. So we just have essentially right the, the controller, the controller, and then the model that receive that, the process that request, just dispatch and say, hey, uh, the product was just uh, was just added to the cart. Here's the product, you know, and 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 you know, do your thing. That is the most useful way for customization in Magento One. In Magento Two. We, we just went crazy and we said, let's turn every single public method in the system into an event. It's really awesome, it's really powerful. It can be used for extreme good. It can also be used for extreme evil. Um, and, and, and there will be, I'm sure that we'll, as time goes on, we'll find some, I, I can't wait to collect some really bad examples of how this works. But essentially what you do is you declare a plugin, you say, hey, uh, for this, uh, this block here, which is just the, the block that renders the, the header area. You know what, I want, you know, instantiate this class here. Right, so instantiate this class, let's take a look at this class definition. And in here, there is this public function after get welcome. And the way this works is, if there happens to be a public get welcome method in the the class which I've targeted, this bit of code will actually execute after that method. And we have plugin architecture that does uh, before, after, and around. Uh, and and it, um, some of the magic there is just using a closure. Um, but this, like I said, this, this essentially turns every public method into uh, a, a consumable event. And you can stack you know, you can, you can do, it just, because, just because I have a module that's looking at this, that's doing something with get welcome, I, there could be other modules that do it as well. I mean, as a developer, you have to evaluate what's happening, and, and you always have to pay attention if there are two, two different modules working with, you know, one method, you may need to go in and figure out the logic. You may still have a, a conflict there. But, but, but this gives you a much smaller surface area for, um, gives you a much smaller surface area for, uh, for, your, for your plugins. Basically, it means that if I need to change core behavior in Magento 1, I would actually have to, you know, sort of take ownership of this class definition, um, possibly. Now, multiple, uh, multiple, um, multiple modules can work with the same class without stepping on each other's toes. So that is our dependency injection system. It, it's not without it's not without its um, complexity because when we um, when we converted Magento one code to um, sales model order, um, when we converted our our code to um, this dependency injection idiom, and we use constructor based injection some smells popped out. For example, here's the constructor for the sales object. And those are all the dependencies. So we have our own custom uh, dependency injection handler, uh, basically an object manager, and we can lazy load resources. But this is the kind of thing uh, that actually indicates that you have a good, at least a good uh, design idiomatically, because it makes, it makes bad code smell, right? It makes the smell obvious. Yeah, but the, you know this is still, so 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 you know we 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 did our best to follow single responsibility principle, um, especially with new code that we were writing. This is this is clearly you know a class that knows too much. Um, again, it's something that we're working. On. This is this is this is something we consider technical debt. Yeah, it's a lot. And, but you know the, the interesting thing is again you this this is handled for you. In fact, we have. Uh, part of how we handle this, um, we have some magic with, with factories and, and, and so forth, and there's a whole service layer that I don't have time to get into. Um, basically, it's just a, a uniform uh, little mini framework for how to handle API and SPI. Uh, but this code, a lot of, actually a lot of these class definitions may end up getting materialized on the fly, so we're doing like aspect-oriented programming as well. We're, we're, we're basically took all the, all the tools in the kitchen and, and picked like the best five and built them into the framework. Um, 
Yes, a lot more. There's a lot more to get into. I, I actually just was teaching a class last last week in uh, in Nairobi, um, and I always get fired up like helping people discover, uh, helping people discover our, you know, the, the our architecture and how flexible it can be. Um, yeah, I think that's that's it. Oh, and and sorry, as a proof of point, uh, talking about Composer. Uh, we do have, if you, install, if, you get, if you install Magento using Composer, which is how you should do it unless you want to contribute to the core code, everything just ends up under here and you can see all of our modules are, um, all of our modules are individual, s discrete components and they all have versions And you can see that their version number is completely different from our marketing version number, from like the two dot. Uh, so we have this internal framework version because this actually will follow semantic versioning. So as a if you if you're you know developing for a merchant or if you are uh, developing as a um, extension developer, as long as you as long as you craft your um, your dependency. Um, as long as you are using the right specificity with your dependencies, um, it, it, it's very easy to signal to people when it's time to upgrade or when they've upgraded something that, that isn't compatible with what you're doing. So the whole point of, of Composer. Uh, right. That's that. So... Um, Happy to talk more or just go even into more architectural stuff um, as time goes on. If you want to get up and running, and I have a link uh, on the next slide, um, DevBox is something that we've created. That's Docker. And it actually, I had personally been avoiding it because it heard so many problems uh, with it just being, being slow, et cetera. But we, we've, we've got it tuned pretty well now. Um, so DevBox is it's just it's a, it's a, a Docker. Uh, Docker setup that will get you up and running as a developer quickly, and then we have documentation for how to get your IDE working with it, get Xdebug working with it, etc. Um, another interesting thing that we've done is uh, we've we've moved to a sustaining engineering model, um, and uh, that's a, it's a definition wor worth looking up. Uh, but essentially, it's all about maintaining maintaining quality and health. And so we also have an extension quality program. We have a series of tests that you can run against your code to make sure it matches our code standards. And all of this kind of combines into this new thing that we're doing called community engineering. We took our former lead of Magenta 2 development and he picked four of his, like four of our top architects. And so we are now going around to all of the community events. Well, not all of them, but, but a lot of the big community events um, we have two, two coming up in, um, in India at the beginning of May, and we're doing contribution days. So this is a team who is responsible for processing pull requests. So one of the, one of the problems we had with Magento 2 was people were so interested in it, and they started filing issues. They started writing pull requests, and it would take us six months to get to the pull request, which is a recipe for killing an open source project, um, or killing interest in it. Um, but now we have a team dedicated to that. So like in February, they merged 150 pull requests in the main line. Uh, and, and, and several of them came from contribution days. So this is people showing up to an event a day early, and they spend a few, a few hours actually working with our architects. Um, in addition to this, we actually have, uh, we have some community gatekeepers who are working, um, you know, working on processing pull requests um, sort of independently of this as well. Um, another area of investment is a project that I'm, I'm running, which is functional localization. This is actually how we can change our build, build uh, functional packs that localize Magento, not just language, but also functionality. For example, um, the first thing we heard when we, when we got to China last year was, hey, guess what? Uh, consumers here don't use email. So it makes no sense that, that your you know, that you're, um, that, that, you know, for, for, for them to see an email field when they're trying to register or check out, they want to put in, they want to put in their phone number, you know, or they want to use, um, you know, WeChat or something. I mean, it, it basically, th there, there are fundamental changes as we go to different places. So 
I'm working with uh, partners in different regions. I'm also working with open source communities in different regions to build these functional packs. Um, and then finally, um, wrapping this all together, we have, we're, we're working on our community backlog. This is actually going to take our product, uh, basically our product team, their prioritization, the things they want to build, and uh, exposing it for the public to work on uh, with, with sort of notes on priority. How to get involved? Um, well, github.com slash Magento is a lot of our stuff there. Uh, we have our community forums, which are run by our, um, our outstanding community manager, Sherry. <coughs> meetup. Of course, you have, you have a meetup here in Singapore. I don't, have to, I don't have to tell you, like, hey, someone needs to start one here. Um, our, uh, there are um, a number of community-run hackathons. And you can find a lot of really good, good output from that under the Magento Hackathon um, account. Of course, Stack Exchange, uh, I, I, was, um, I started that site uh, back in 2014, I think, maybe end of 2013, um, with the help of many other community folk. Um, we actually have documentation now, which is a really big bonus for, for, for Magento. Uh, Magento 1 totally lacked documentation. Uh, Magento 2, we actually have tech writers, uh, but it's very cool. The, our documentation on every single page in the top right, you'll see report an issue or edit this page. And so that's all built. What's that ghost? Forget, I forget what it's built. Basically, all the content's hosted on GitHub. And Jekyll, Jekyll, it's built, I think, using Jekyll. Um, so you can actually submit a pull request if you find, if you want to add something or change something. <coughs> uh, I mentioned our dev box. This is where you can get it. You'll have to create an account uh, to download it, but that's a, you like to, to use Magenta 2, you have to have an account because you need authorization keys uh, to work with it. And if you prefer Vagrant, uh, my, uh, my friend uh, Joshua Warren, he and his wife uh, own, a, um, own one of our um, most outstanding agencies uh, in the States. Joshua still has not, he's, he's, he's held on to his technical, his technical ability, so he's got a vagrant environment, and it's actually Mage Scotch. And Mage Scotch is great because it, it, has, it actually gives you a Magento 1 instance and a Magento 2 instance. And if you're used to working with vagrant, that's your, that's your pony. And that's all I have. Whew. Got through that. About the right time for Q&A, too. Um, any, uh, any questions? I know that that was a whole lot of content all at once. Um, yes, so I'll, um, yes, so the, the question was, the question was, so in Magento repositories, the code is structured directly, structure is different, right? Right. From Composer, it's different. So how do we make it globally, like some users having use uh, repository method, some other users composer method? Um, OK, so general question, um, I'll repeat for the, uh, for the audio, just around. Magento, Magento has multiple installation paths, right? Uh, it's actually technically three. Uh, so I'll explain those. So you have, you have a typical like composer create project, right? And then you just pass in the Magento handle and composer does the rest. Um, and actually that's part, part thanks to our community that that works because we have some, Magento always kind of does something a little interesting. Um, so so we, we, put our own, we put our own little spin on that. Um, then there is the ability you can actually just git clone from our from the Magento 2 repository, uh, and then you can also install via archive, like so you can just download a zip and, and put it in place. Uh, the third one, I, so just don't do that, right? Because you're, at some point you're going to need to you're going to want to administer everything with Composer. Um, I mean, you could have a very specific reason to do that, like if you depending on your um, if you have like continuous integration or continuous deployment, that is why that is allowed. Um, if you want to contribute to Magento 2 code base, then that's when you, that's when you create your Magento instance by using git clone. And uh, using git clone and then, you know, you can um, 
post pull requests to the develop branch. And that's how, that's how you, you can give back to our code base. But for any like production instance or managing client installation, that's when you would use, um, that's when you would use Composer. And, and it, what's, confu what's confusing though is when you use Composer uh, to install, that's actually when you get that's when you get the code base under um, under vendor under vendor Magento, right? If you use if you use Git clone, it ends up here under app code. And so what I what I recommend, um, and, and this it, it's not it's not an imperative, but it's a, it's a, it's a recommendation that. Um, you know, if I were still managing merchant installations, I would have all of your extensions would install here. And if I were, and if I were creating any extensions that I would be using on multiple merchants, I would, I would go ahead and, and, you know, composerize them and make sure that they install in a vendor. Any local changes, changes local and specific for that installation, I think it's perfectly fine to build them under app code. It, it, but it can be a little confusing. We, we actually do, we have a pretty thorough explanation on DevDocs. So if you, if you just search for, you know, install Magento 2, uh, you, you, I think the, the first or at least one of the first results is our developer documentation. And we'll, we'll exp, you know, we'll, we'll sort of give you the lay of the land and how to do that. Um, now coming soon though, we like the, uh, the DevBox actually will hook up with Magento Cloud. So that's our, our platform offering and then we're, we're, we'll be offering um, like limited time free trials of cloud. Now cloud is intended right now, I mean cloud is a, it's a, it's a, it's a fairly hefty price so it's, a, it's intended for that kind of really big small merchant uh, to the mid-market. But we are, we are working on ways with platform to actually get that product a bit smaller and a bit more affordable. Uh, just to kind of take hosting and CDN out of the question for you, or out of your, out of your responsibility. Um, yeah, did that answer question? Okay. Any other uh, any other questions? Yeah. The Magento e-commerce is a life of most some companies as well. So, how well does Magento support clustering in a high level? Ah, so the question, how well does uh, Magento support clustering and high availability? Um, Magento Enterprise, so Magento has two versions. We have a, like the, our you know, totally free open source community version. Um, we're working on the naming because it, it's very confusing for us to talk about our lovely community and then have a community version. And then um, our enterprise version, so our enterprise version is actually just, it, it actually is the community version with uh, additional, basically additional modules and functionality. Um, out of the box, um, Enterprise Edition has RabbitMQ, so basically native job queuing, um, has uh, support for MySQL clustering, um, has the ability to actually split, uh, like the order, so order processing in any e-commerce app is, is inherently complex and intensive. Um, so we, uh, we actually have the ability for the sales process to split off into, um, to split that off into a separate database. Um, let me see what else. Um, catalog, so that in, in, in any version, you can, you, can, you, can, you can wire up the different modules to a different data store. Right, as long as the adapter's there, and the adapter probably should be there since you can pull in anything from any of the other frameworks as long as they're PSR compliant. Um, there, in fact, are, so in Magento 1 even, you could do this, and there, there, there is a project that, for example, has, um, does order archiving into MongoDB, right? Um, yeah, MongoDB, we use EAV, uh, an EAV storage pattern for our, for our complex entities like customer, basically the, the entities with ar arbitrary attributes, like products, customers, addresses, um, and kind of sales. Um, 
and so many people for so long, I, I have to have this conversation at least a dozen times a year, like, you know, Magento, you're stupid, you should use MongoDB for this, period, end of story. And I've, it's, so many people have tried, and it just doesn't work. It, it's, it's very, it is, it, the idea, EAV feels very schemaless because you're essentially building a schema into your schema. Um, because everything is so separated out and essentially abstracted, but it, yeah, it's really, really hard. Um, where I've seen novel uses for uh, different data stores, especially for like catalog data, is people building, um, building catalog and, and reading from Solar or Elasticsearch. Uh, so we have partners that have done it. So, so it's possible. All you have to do is just make the adapter for it or you know, pull one in from, from a project. Um, and then for probably for deeper discussions, I'm not the man you need to talk to because uh, I don't, I never, I never had to deal with, with, with scaling stuff. I, the agency I worked for, we always had, you know, guys who were really good at DevOps that were, they were our, our, our sort of our, our uh, the ones who helped us achieve scale. Uh, but, but there's no doubt, I mean, so like Magento out of the box um, can, you know, given a certain hardware profile, um, we have white papers in terms of what it can do. When you need to stretch beyond that, when you need to get like 5,000 orders an hour, um, you know, or you, let's say, I think that the most, the most I've heard, uh, there's a very, like one of our top partners in Germany, um, they did, I think their, their top example was the Angry Birds site back when Ang Angry Birds was really popular. And they had that, they had that, on Magento 1, running off AWS with auto scaling, I think, and they had that certified to 10 orders per second, which is screaming fast. Uh, but you know, it takes it takes work, and you have you have to handle, uh, you have to figure out your strategy for that. And, and at scale, um, everything your know, caching, all that stuff at a certain scale, it becomes very focused on the, on the customer. We try and build things as generically as possible to make sense. Like Magento 2, we actually have native full page caching, which is an enterprise feature in Magento 1. We have native full page caching in, just built into Magento 2 core, and we're just using, basically just using Varnish. So um, your, your, your page response is, um, of course, is quite fast, and then you get and, you know, and then once you do something stateful, like a customer logs in or a customer adds something to the cart, uh, that's when you come up with different strategies. And that's when, like for us, we have, um, we have a whole front-end architecture. It's a, little, it's a little complicated, but we have a front-end architecture that uh, theoretically just works, right? So even when someone logs in, you know, we, we have a very narrow bootstrap for the app. Like the, the whole interface comes back served right out of uh, Varnish out of the reverse proxy. And then, you know, maybe the, the number of items in the cart or the, you know, hello, Benjamin, um, the, 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 the customer greeting, that's actually just done via um, an asynchronous JavaScript request. Yeah, and, and, and our idea is to build all of this for you and help developers do your job. Um, and we're, we're getting there. It's still, it's still a little opinionated and it's still a little, um, it's still a little bit of a big architecture, but we're working on it. But you get a lot. I mean, you get a lot of bang for your buck. Um, like with, uh, we have a whole front end UI component framework that that uses Knockout that uh, tries to, to do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. Um, any other questions? I got time for like one more. Ah, so we did that too. Yeah, okay. so in Magento 2, we do, we have like this, Magento 2 has a couple of different modes. Um, so, I mean, this question is about deployment. Um, right, so you have, so when Magento is in developer mode, it, the application is doing a lot of, it's doing a lot of calculation to determine like, hey, do I have all of the generated class definitions that I need? Are things in the right place? And if not, I can, I can actually infer and extrapolate where I should get them from and pull them in. And then when you, flip the, when you flip the system over into um, production mode, yes, the assumption is everything is there. Um, so one of the, uh, one of the stories, 2.1.6, which just came out, hu uh, huge performance improvement in, uh, in static 
believe it was 2.1.6, where we had um, static asset generation time reduced quite a bit. Um, and there, we're not done there, actually. We actually will be doing more work. Uh, we also moved, uh, we also moved some of the generated folders, we actually moved where they're located. Uh, because of, uh, we, because like our cloud environment actually requires, um, doesn't allow write access for the production instance. So you have to have, you have to have like this generated content over here and, and sort of like, uh, the, I guess the analogous thing would be like an S3 bucket, right? Um, I, think that, I think that's right. I can, I can, if, you have, if you really need, if you need nuanced, nuanced details, um, I can get you in touch with the, the right people who are looking at this stuff. Um, cool. That's all I have. So we have, I tried to make heads or tails. You, you have a very deep presentation coming up, I think. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing it. Um, if you didn't take a look uh, at, the, at the site, it's... Uh, I, 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 after like 50 hours of traveling, I just couldn't think anymore. So I'm looking, I'm looking forward to your explanation. So thank you guys very much for your attention. And uh, yeah, thanks for being here.